G. Car club meetings. Church can unite members for community, fellowship, sacraments, prayer, and mission. Community. At last, we've arrived at the point where we'll start learning how the local church is like an auto club. It's awful that many Christians think church is a place you go to. Perhaps this is because we haven't fully gotten away from Rome's way of doing things, treating church like a religious building you go to rather than a group of people you're a part of. Perhaps it's been made worse by modern influence that has encouraged this wrong way of thinking. Our churches are now full-fledged service businesses, even with services and functions offered at set times. Perhaps it's because many of us go to be served rather than to serve. We go to receive something rather than to be a part of something. And those who work in churches often think of it like a job as well. They're there to serve and give to those who come, like a service business. Both are viewing the institution transactionally. Perhaps because we treat church like any other service business, our concern as a consumer is finding one that meets all our preferences. If we find one that does, we're willing to drive farther to go there. Compare this mindset with the early churches, which were small gatherings that met in people's homes. They were small, intimate, and within walking distance. The first church buildings didn't start to appear until the early 200s. All these reasons contribute to how we see what church is and what it's for. It's not meant to be an auto repair shop, but rather an auto club. Jesus' church and all of its local expressions were not intended to be something you go to, but something to be a part of. Something transformational that you belong to. Transforming not only individuals and the group as a whole, but also the communities the groups are located in. Churches weren't intended to be places where a few gifted give and everyone else receives. They were intended to be communal, all give, all receive. Everyone plays a role, an important role. Everyone is an important part of the body, not just the head and the mouth. Jesus didn't intend the quote-unquote hands to go look for a church designed to accommodate the personalities and desires of hands. It's the unity within diversity that is its strength and glory. The left-brained, logical, rational, together with the right-brained, creative, charismatic. The young and old learning from one another. The mature and immature. The educated and uneducated. The experienced and inexperienced. The deeply spiritual with the deeply intellectual. Everyone growing as a result. It's the environment not suited for people looking to be served, to get or do what they want. The environment that intentionally puts everyone out of their comfort zones. So we're all challenged to grow in ways God desires us to grow. Different perspectives aren't shunned. They're discussed. Through empathic listening by people who appreciate diversity of thought, all coming together to pursue spirit and truth in a win-win synergistic pursuit of God's glory. The church is to be like an auto club that has a diverse group of people all united around a love for a common interest. In this case, it isn't cars. It's Jesus. He's the one thing that unites everyone, and he's more than enough. 
Throughout this chapter, we'll look at some of the ways churches can pursue the right atmosphere for these benefits. One of the basic functions of the church is community. Though we may not always fully appreciate or utilize this aspect of the church, most know that it's more available. Many Christians deal with their personal struggles alone, even though the church was expressly created so we don't have to. Most people also struggle for a sense of community and contribution, a sense of belonging, a sense of being a part of something important, something greater than themselves. This need is often met in unhealthy ways. God has provided the church to meet this need. It's a shame that many are much more passionate and invested into their political party, sports teams, dependent relationships, or other clubs or hobbies. These things could be fine to enjoy or could be fruitless, purposeless idols that consume way more of us than they should. Which community are you most passionate about and invested in? Fellowship Fellowship is an important aspect of local church community. Fellowship is any social gathering for the purpose of building community bonds. It could be meals, outdoor outings, social events, lighthearted games, music and dancing, comedy shows, theaters, or plays, or anything else in the presence and spirit of the Lord that helps members form a sense of belonging and relationship building with one another. Fellowship was an important part of early Israelite community. God created a fellowship offering, which was an animal offering, first sacrificed to God, that was then eaten and enjoyed together by the community. A fellowship offering was also called a peace offering, or an offering of thanksgiving. It was a meal shared together in gratitude to God. The Sabbath, which was sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, was a time specifically set aside every week where no working or labor or trip-taking or cooking was permitted. Food preparation was done prior to sunset. The Sabbath was an ideal time for people to spend time with God and their families and communities to share food, stories, music, worship, and time together. This activity is harder to do for us not having a weekly Sabbath day by living separately and farther from one another and viewing church as something we go to rather than something we're a part of in our own neighborhood. However, we can still keep the spirit of fellowship alive and well if we're creative and intentional. Sacraments Sacraments are an essential part of Christian community. While they have been given to the whole church, their most common expression will be within the local assembly. A sacrament is something set apart for a sacred purpose. While many institutions are sacred, marriage for example, and activities are sacred, prayer and worship for example, in the church there are only two things given sacrament status within the Protestant tradition, baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is because only these two rites have the following three distinguishing features. 1. They were instituted by Christ. 2. Christ enjoined, i.e. directed or imposed by authoritative order or with urgent admonition, them to his followers. And 3. They were bound up with Christ's word and revelation in such a way that they become, quote, the expressions of divine thoughts 
the visible symbols of divine acts. Unquote. By these criteria, these two are the only New Testament sacraments. Baptism. Baptism, from the Greek baptizo, means to dip or submerge in water, and is a ceremonial rite of one's faith and public acceptance of Jesus as Lord and Savior and initiation into his church. Jesus gave a clear command to do this just prior to his ascent into heaven, in Matthew 28, 19, which reads, quote, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, end quote. An example of this in action is only ten days later on Pentecost, the first day of the new church, in Acts 2, verses 37 through 38, which reads, quote, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. End quote. For more on baptism, see chapter 1, section K. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a distinctive rite of Christian worship instituted by Jesus on the night before his crucifixion. It's a, quote, religious partaking of bread and wine, which, having been presented before God the Father in thankful memorial of Christ's inexhaustible sacrifice, have become, through sacramental blessing, the communion of the body and blood of Christ. End quote. Jesus gave a clear command to do this, as recorded in Luke 22, verses 19 through 20, writ, which reads, quote, And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. End quote. See also Luke 22, verses 14 through 23, Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29, and Mark 14, verses 22 through 25. The Apostle Paul instructs the church at Corinth to properly observe this sacrament in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 to 34. He says in verse 26, quote, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. End quote. This also happened on the day of Pentecost. The verse shown at the end of this section referred to there as the breaking of bread. For my personal views on baptism and Lord's Supper and my Lord's Supper wall art, visit empoweredchristian.org. Church communities are the ideal place to celebrate sacraments. Prayer Prayer is another purpose and benefit of the communal aspect of the local church. Prayer connects us both to God and to one another. Prayer requests are an opportunity to share our challenges with others and to let them share theirs with us. Simply asking someone if they have prayer needs is an invitation into their lives. It can touch someone tremendously to know you care about them and are willing to not only hear about their problems, but also to earnestly petition God on their behalf. This helps you be a better disciple of Jesus. We can also benefit ourselves from sharing our burdens with others and having them pray to God for us. God's word is clear that when we come together in prayer in Jesus' name, it's effectual and powerful. Another aspect is communal prayer, meaning praying together as a group, which offers additional spiritual benefits. This can be a Holy Spirit-led activity that has the potential to be very spiritually rewarding and fruitful. Many churches will have a prayer time 
where the church leadership meets for group prayer on a specific day or time, and other members are welcome to join. Many churches will also have an intercessory prayer team, consisting usually of volunteers that are available to pray for members. Small group meetings are also a great and less intimidating environment for both group prayer or finding out the prayer needs of individuals. All of these are great, but I'd like to suggest an additional option, that all church members be encouraged to meet and pray for others. Perhaps even a regular activity where everyone in a service meets someone they don't know for this purpose. Churches should intentionally create opportunities for strangers to meet, exchange names with one another, each talking about their lives for a few minutes and praying for one another. This is proactively directing it rather than just suggesting it. This initiates not only prayer, but also relationship building, increased fellowship, and discipleship. Vision and Mission What unites an auto club, or really any kind of club, organization, or group, is a common vision and mission. Each local church should have a vision of why they exist and what they want to help cause to happen. They should also have a mission describing what they do to help accomplish this. It should be specifically created by them and for them and get everyone on the same page. All members should be involved in its creation, so there's emotional investment. All new members should be taught about the vision and mission in a way that helps them engage with it. Church orientation for new members should be part class teaching about the church's history and mission and part discipleship mentoring, learning about the new member and helping them align their values and goals with the churches. Church visions and missions should be like a constitution built upon their statement of faith, with those being the foundation that directs everything else they do. As challenges arise in the future, everyone, including leaders and elders, should submit to it like a governing authority over the whole body. While there should be an elected and or hired leadership, there should also be a level playing field where all members have a voice. Churches shouldn't be a top-down hierarchy where a single leader or a small board dictate their terms to the majority, i.e. my way or the highway. This would contradict the entire point of the local church as a Jesus-headed, Holy Spirit-led congregation of believers united for a common purpose. Rather, the congregation should be seen as a living organism, a body. It's not about what one or a few want to the exclusion of the others. It's about what's good for the health of the whole body. Sometimes the Lord introduces conflict not to divide, but to guide. It's through Holy Spirit-led unity and collaboration we will thrive. Acts 2.41 Those who embraced his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the believers that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they shared with anyone who was in need. With one accord, they continued to meet daily in the temple courts and to break bread from house to house, sharing their meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 